without further ado, should we begin? Yes, let us commence. Okay, yes. So, 91 to 97, I was a student at WK and I always loved being creative. I didn't know that it was eventually going to be how I made a living, but I used to um, write silly stories. There was a group called Authors Anonymous, which we set up in um, M. Flabeni, which I was part of, and I used to, any excuse I had to jump on a stage, I would take it. So at first, I used to be on the SRC, Student Representative Council, every year, even though I had no interest in student politics. I just liked being the person to stand up and talk to people. So I didn't fully understand what it was, but I used to choose every excuse to be on stage. Um, we used to do for our uh, community service, we did AIDS education. And I, of course, was like, why don't we write a play? And let's perform the play to teach people. So I would find a way to put something creative into whatever I was doing. But I didn't know. I, at that time, I was good at math. And my family was telling me, as I'm sure a lot of your parents may be telling you, that the only path and the only way is to uh, become a programmer or to become a doctor or something like that. So I finished at WK and even though at the time I had decided I want to be a writer of big fat pretentious novels, I was like, I'm going to be the next Wole Shoyinka. I um, was accepted to Philadelphia School of the Arts in the US, but my family were like, no way, no way, don't throw away your future absolutely refused and even though I had a partial scholarship, I still needed their help to eat. So <laughs> I had to go with their decision. So this is how I ended up in Canada studying computer programming instead of pursuing what I wanted to pursue. I was very grumpy, but you know, what you gotta do? You gotta make your life work. And interestingly, fate kind of interceded because while I was in Canada, I discovered stand-up comedy which was, uh, there's a festival there called the Just For Last Festival. I'd never watched stand-up comedy in my life. And I walked into a comedy club with a bunch of computer programming students. And when I saw it, I was like, this is, what I, this is amazing. I need to try this. And so I started doing open mics. And in the next two years, it went from being my hobby to being all I wanted to do all the time every day. I switched university from uh, this computer programming uh, school, this creative writing school, uh, Concordia, which is in, also in Canada. And then after that, it was making a bad living as a, a comedian. So you've got to understand, I always see people actually want to become a writer or a musician. You've got to really, really, really love it because it, for a very long time, it can be a soul-crushing endeavor because there's no regular rejection. So if you are a writer, you are getting rejected almost every day because even right now, I have three different things which are being looked at by different producers. And maybe one of them will be made, but you're constantly getting letters, no, not for us. No, you're not so great. You're constantly going to auditions and being told, no, you're not the one for us. And it can really get you down. But if you really love it, and for me, performing was my greatest delight and writing was my greatest delight, you're able to get through all of the constant crushing rejection. But I've still got to say, you've got to really love it. <laughs> so that was my career from around 2005 until around, for around 12 years. That was my life getting by, struggling, uh, having moments of, you know, doing a good performance and then struggling to pay my rent, but believing I'm funny. And then I had a turning point, which is I did Britain's Got Talent and um, I did really well. I came third and I had done it when I was so frustrated, I'd given up. I was like, you know what? I might as well do this silly competition because my career is not going anywhere. So, it was like buying a, a scratch card and playing the lottery. I didn't really think 
I had a chance of doing well. And then I ended up doing really well. And then my career since has been entirely different. Now I've been touring and I've been doing radio and television, but this is 12 years, it wasn't 12 years in. This is like, so 2001 till 2017 was a very ropey career. And then 2017 to now has been a wonderful career, but it was all worth it. And in a weird way, I'm glad it happened now because I had a chance of a break in 2008. Uh, there was a, something that almost happened and then didn't happen. But if it had happened, then maybe I wouldn't have been ready and I would have been tempted by, you know, I don't know. There are lots of artists who lose their lives or get tempted by all kinds of shallow things which come with fame. But now I'm old enough that I'm who I am. So it's fine. So that's pretty much, that's my path from where I started WK to where you see me now. <laughs> and if I had to just summarize the things which I think are most important for any of you who is considering something artistic, but it's not necessarily something artistic. It's something where you're self-employed. Because this applies also to people who are, uh, let's say you're a businessman, anything where you're not just going into an office and working. The things which are really difficult is you have to work harder than people who have a boss sitting there. And that's a very hard thing to do. Like I wake up in the morning and there's no one there waiting for me to, to walk in. So you have to, um, you have to just, so I have a daily schedule. So I write for six hours, then I do, do some reading and then I'll perform for two hours and then I'll edit for one hour. So I, you have to fill your life and you have to create all of the deadlines that would be there if you had a normal job. So if I had a normal job, my boss wouldn't allow me to just sit in and watch Netflix for four hours. So even though I do that myself, I've got to treat myself very strictly because early on in my career, I would just sort of write when I was inspired. And that's a terrible way of looking at it. It's something you've got to do every day. It's something you've got to turn into a routine, something you've got to turn into a, a habit. And that's what I've done. And, you know, I talk to you about how you get rejected all the time, but you also fail all the time. And I think one of the things which helped a lot is I realized failing isn't a bad thing. So, for example, if I write a play and the play is terrible and it gets one star reviews, nobody likes it, it feels bad at the time. But at the end of the day, it doesn't destroy me and I can write another thing. When I started out, I was very precious about every piece. And if something was rejected, it would really dissuade me and it would take me months to get the, the willpower back to write something new. And I think the big thing, I wish a time traveler could have told me back when I was starting out that the stuff which I'm writing and the stuff that I'm auditioning for at the beginning of my career isn't the best stuff I'm ever going to produce. And I should have just looked at them as, you know, the car which you learn how to drive in, which gets bashed up a bit, not the car which you retire in. So I think a big thing is uh, anybody who's considering this, you have to write a lot. Or if you're a musician, you have to play a lot. If you're an artist, you have to paint a lot. It's quantity actually over quality in a weird way because I used to think I want to create this one magnificent opus which is going to last forever but really in the world right now especially because there's so much content you actually just have to produce and produce and produce and maybe one of them will be your masterpiece but I think it's worth more to try and be that person who produces something every day than to be that person who works 20 years and produces one amazing thing because Again, if you're doing 20 years to one amazing thing, you're not living off it. And you've got to be pragmatic about it if that's the path you want to go. Uh, the other thing which I think is always amazing is nothing is finished. So if you write something and it's bad, you can always rewrite it. If you create something and it's offensive, you can always rewrite it and make it less offensive. So it doesn't necessarily have to stay that way. Now, this isn't necessarily true 
for all the arts, because I know you might all be interested in different things, but definitely for fiction and for playwriting and for writing comedy, it's always, it's never finished. So it's always something that I don't mind if I fail and make it bad because I'm like, well, maybe the third draft will be better. I wrote a radio play for the BBC and we did have a crazy producer, but we wrote 16 drafts. I wrote it with a, 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 a guy, Sibusiso Mamba, who was also a WK student, and we co-wrote this play, but our crazy producer kept saying, change this and change that, was too ambitious and wanted this play, which was just a funny play, to solve the AIDS problem and to solve gender issues and to say, and we're just like, it's just a play. We can't put all of those things in it. Well, either way, it's good to be ambitious, even if it's not possible. So that's generally, if I had to summarize, it's just productivity and dealing with failure and rejection a lot. And um, also just understanding it doesn't have to be a solitary affair. One big thing is if you are someone who's being artistic you can be like a hermit and do it alone but the actual thing is especially nowadays in the world of um the internet and so like there's a lot of collaboration that's possible so like i said i co-wrote a play with somebody i'm doing some jokes about black lives matter on the radio like around half an hour after i finish this and for that i called a friend of mine and i told him all the jokes i'm going to tell and then he gave me feedback and said maybe not that one maybe tweak this one and I just think a collaborative way of looking at things you create is very helpful because uh, many minds are better than one yes <laughs> so that is sort of my random ramble um, I see Tracy Tracy in um, group chat said what made you join Britain's Got Talent so I'll tell you the actual truth I auditioned a lot. Part of my career was going for auditions and you'd find out a vague response about why they didn't want to go for you. And I didn't know why, you never really knew why they didn't want you. And then the last straw was in 2016, I went for an audition for a, a show which will remain nameless, but this is a television show, to be a comedian on it. And the producer told my agent, we really like Deliso, but he clashes with someone else we've had on this series. And I was like, what do you mean clashes? And they explained to my agent that they'd had someone called Fumbi Amotayo on the show. And in their weird quota system, they felt, oh no, we can't have two black comedians on the same series. It's gonna, it, it was this really absurd thing. And it's, really frustrating if you're a performer in the UK or if you're a performer in America and you're ethnic, often that's a factor. Like if I'm trying to get on a TV show and they've already got one black actor, that's it. There was only one role, right? I was really tired of it. And then I realized that Britain's Got Talent is not bothered in terms of how many ethnic people, if you actually look at any season, cause it's a competition. Some years they'll have 50, some years they'll have four. It doesn't really matter. And that I liked. And I also liked the idea that when you walk on, if they don't like you, they tell you to your face why they don't like it. Now, some people may think that's terrible, but after years of just getting a form letter rejection, I was like, if you don't want me, I want you to tell me to my face why you don't like it. And then I will know. And that didn't happen. So that was why I did it, Tracy. That was why I did it. Um, now, to the questions which were sent to me, I don't know whose questions they were. Um, somebody asked me, my question is related to the June 16 commemorations at WK in the 90s. Uh, what do I remember? A lot of my peers for, from Surrey, what impact did this have on this future understanding of injustices post WK? So yes, I remember all of the commemorations we used to do. We used to do a Sharpville Day, we used to do uh, June 16th, we used to do uh, like a numbers of, it was a big part of it, and also the plays which we would go to. I remember going to watch an Athol Fugard play called The Captain's Tiger, um, and also I remember The Island was performed at WK, and I actually think 
all of that sort of um, social justice element of the education really has coded the kind of art I produce. So I was always going to be artistic because it's what I love. But I think there's a reason that I end up, I wrote a radio show called Citizen of Noah, which is about colonialism and slavery. I am interested in those kind of issues because since I was 11, I was being brainwashed by WK to care about this kind of thing, right? So I think that um, all of these uh, commemorations really made a difference to me. And just this Sunday, I went to the Manchester Black Lives Matter demonstrations. And I'm sometimes a little cynical in that I think, I don't think it's gonna change public policy or change things like that. But at the same time, I see little nine-year-olds holding up these signs. And that's where I see the positivity because I'm like, well, they're being, they're, that little nine-year-old's gonna grow up thinking that this matters. And that's who it's for, not really for the system, which is you know, possibly broken beyond repair. So yes, yes, that is what I remember. Um, next question. I have a question there and I have a question there. I'll go to this one first. So Bora Luganda says, as there's a level of uncertainty of what you'll produce in the future and what the next steps will be, how do I find security in his talents? And what's the determinant that made me choose to pre... Okay. So there are two parts of the question. So first of all, you asked me to say, is how do I find security in my talents? The way I actually do it is I produce a lot and I'm always applying to do lots of different things. So if I was just to say this week, I've uh, submitted a script for consideration to the BBC. I've submitted a pitch for a cooking show. I've submitted uh, a stand-up comedy set possibility for something and I've submitted a tour possibility with social distancing to theater. So because each thing has maybe a 20% chance of happening, I just do lots and lots of them, and then eventually one or two <laughs> to happen. And it's a very weird way to live, but also the other thing about um, being an, a, a comedian is it's seasons of famine and seasons of plenty. So sometime I will get like, oh, Coca-Cola wants you to come and host their awards. And you get paid very well for that. And that there is going to keep me through the six months of no work. And that's sort of the way you've got it. While other people can just know every month they're gonna get refreshed. A lot of people who are doing what I have to do, you almost have to be like, oh, I got something big and I've got to stretch it until the next big thing. So that's that. And then the second one, uh, which was Bora also asked, what is the determining factor that made me choose creativity against all the warnings about how they're not real jobs? And I think I had no choice in a way because it was the only thing I loved. Yes, I, I can't even say anything beyond that. If I had loved anything else, I probably would be doing that because I was good at uh, you know, my, it's, it's still IB, right? It's still IB, a WK, yeah. So I did physics and math. I, I was this sort of technical past person because my, I was good at it, even though my heart was more in, you know, I was doing a subsidy of, um, of theater arts and that mattered more to me than my physics thing. But I, the only thing I enjoyed was creativity. So after a while, it took me probably my 20s to realize that if I do anything else, I'll be miserable. So <laughs> I tried a lot of other jobs and I was like, no, I, I'm still living this day for the one hour after work, I can go and type a short story. So that was it. Um, I'm going to look at one of the questions I'll send behind is, I've often wondered how stand-up comedians navigate the spaces of political correctness, self-censorship, that happens there, does that make sense? Okay, that does make sense. Now look, political correctness is an issue in that every other day you hear about someone getting in trouble for someone they said or some artist losing their, their job or role because they said something that's not politically correct. The truth is there's so many different kinds of artists. There's some of them who, it's like, it depends who your audience is. 
So it's things like there are artists who just are offensive. If you think about uh, shows like uh, South Park, you, you can get away with all sorts of things, but they are for a specific audience. And then there are other things which are for all ages, which are much more uh, accepting. So I actually think I have changed. So before 2017, I was someone who just did what I thought was funny. Whatever I thought was funny, no matter if it's offensive or not, politically correct or not, I would just do it. After 2017, I realized that Britain's Got Talent has lots of little children fans. When at my shows, there's now usually an 11 year old and a 12 year old. So I can't do some of the material which I used to do beforehand because I know who's watching and who's listening. But at the same time, I think if I'm making a point, I can say anything. So like, for example, today, cause I have a point to make about the Black Lives Matter protests, I don't even worry about being politically correct because I am making a point which I think is important and whatever words I use are just part of that, um, that goal. Yeah, so that's sort of my, I don't know if that made sense, but that's my answer to that. Okay, next we have a, a question from Simon to everyone. You would say that me and Trevor Noah are your favorite comedians. Great to hear. That's a very good company to be with. I did a, a tour with him in Cape Town long before he was famous, and he was always amazing. Um, both of us have left our home countries and are making a career overseas, right? Now, you want to know, um, am I considering going back to Malawi at some point, or did you? Now, the actual thing is, I go back to Malawi every year, and I do a big show. But the truth is, I couldn't live there and do what I love. Because one, people can't afford to, like in the UK, I perform six nights a week. In Malawi, I can perform once a month. <laughs> because there was one time when I came and put on a big show, it didn't say much as the last time. I didn't understand why. And then the next day people were approaching me and saying, ah, why didn't you, I wanted to come, but I couldn't afford. Why didn't you have it on payday? And that is a big restriction. That's a big restriction. The fact that people can't afford to buy tickets in Malawi means that if I was in Malawi, I would end up being a presenter or end up doing ads for, for cell C or cell phones. I wouldn't be a comedian. I would be a funny personality doing stuff and that's not what i want to do so yes so as, that is why i'm not currently in malawi i still go back and i'm working with someone who's trying to create an industry over there but at the same time i gotta eat so <laughs> i live in the uk okay next question um okay there was a question here um what was the experience like in at the school I think I've sort of mentioned that. I loved being in WK. There were some, uh, there were some difficult moments, but it was mostly delight and um, yeah. The one thing which I think you've got to appreciate, which you won't appreciate until years after you leave a school, is it's an amazing thing to be surrounded by intelligent people because you have conversations about ideas. You have conversations about philosophy. You have amazing conversations. And in 15 years, you end up at a bar where everyone just wants to talk about football. And you're like, but what, what, what about, what about Sartre? What about Socrates? And no one wants to listen to what you have to say. So I appreciate having all those clever minds around you. Okay, next uh, question. Can you share on us what point you want to make on Black Lives Matter? Okay, so there are several jokes I'm going to make, but the one point which I'm going to put is probably about the idiots who go on, when people say Black Lives Matter, there's a lot of pushback in the UK. Of people saying, oh, it's all lives matter, it's all lives matter. And the joke which I'm going to be doing, which is sort of making the point, is saying that it's not, the phrase is Black Lives Matter, it's not Black Lives Matter, only. I think these people in their head put the word only on the end of every phrase they hear. 
And then that's the point I'm making. Then how I make it absurd is I'm going to give a few examples of things where they must be putting only. So when they heard the health service say, wash your hands in their head, they must have heard wash your hands only. And since then they've kept the rest of their body filthy and just wash their hands. And I give similar. So often my comedic um, strategy is I make a point and then add an absurd notion after it. And I think because of that, it doesn't matter how ridiculous or offensive the thing I'm saying is, it's in service of the point I'm making. Yeah. So that's one, but I'm making around five, five points. Okay, next we've got, um, what held me back the most in following an artistic uh, career? Um, having to pay the bills having to eat. So you can never be as creative as you want to be because of practical concerns. For, so for a long time, I had like a data entry boring job. While I would have loved to spend all my time creating, I didn't because you've got that practical reality. This is what you have to do. And then the other thing is often you have to write what sells as opposed to what you want to write. So you can't necessarily write. Yeah, so if, if, I'll give you a perfect example. I'm writing a novel right now, which is a young adult novel, which I didn't want to write. But when I spoke to the literary agent and pitched them what I wanted to write, they were like, yeah, we think that would be hard to, to, to sell. How about this? And this is what I'm writing. So that's, what, that's sort of what happens sometimes. You have to compromise a bit, but you still better than any other job. So next question from Pernil. Oh, no, no, from Simon. Oh, no, Simon just says, thank you. Uh, Seputile says, could you expand on the work you're doing to encourage the development of the arts in Malawi? So I, I can't claim ownership of it. So a friend of mine who put on my shows every time I've gone to Malawi, his name is Kabaniso Malawesi, and he's got a little company called Concept Creative. And he put on my first show in Malawi. We both took a big gamble and it did really well. And ever since, he has slowly been adding more shows. He invited Lady Smith Black Mambaso to Malawi. He's been creating a bigger artistic um, sort of uh, just atmosphere there. And I've just always been his investor when he needs an investor the artist who shows up when he can't book anyone and he's like i don't have anyone for february can you help so i I've, I've not been an active person i would say he's the active person but i am in the back saying what do you need i'll give you this so that's 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 all i've done i and i've done a few workshops and stuff but nothing of note okay next question there's some people giggling. What, what, did, what, was, what was funny? No? Or maybe they're giggling at each other. Okay, I'll keep going. Because <laughs> I was like, I didn't say anything funny. <laughs> okay, we keep going. Um, on creativity, what, someone asked, what do I enjoy about being a comedian and being creative in general? It's the greatest thing. It's something from nothing. I, oh, I can't even explain. I, it entertains me more than anything. It's like you start the day. Joy. This is actually something some of you might even consider if you, are, you have a thought or two. There's a, a quote for submission on subject of joy. I don't know what I'm going to write, but every time I've got a spare moment, I sit to myself and I start thinking, how could, what's interesting about joy? What character would I follow if I was talking about joy? And it's science fiction. So I'm like, is this set in the future when joy is in a pill? Is this set in the future when joy is a, a program? And playing all these mind games is fascinating when suddenly it will all fit into place. And I'll be like, there's it. That's the story. And then I'm going to write it. And the whole process is so much fun. I can't, I can't just do it. That's the only way I can explain how, what I enjoy about it. It's so enjoyable to create. And then getting the feedback is the greatest feeling. Like 
being on stage performing with people laughing at the things I say, it's, I couldn't stop doing it. It's like a drug. It's amazing. Okay, next. Ayeyi asked me, just curious, as it seems you still have gigs and shows, how has my job changed and adapted with coronavirus? Okay, so actually I don't currently have a job. So how my job has changed is it has stopped, right? So I am not no longer doing paid shows. I'm no longer doing paid, um, t getting ticket sales and things like that. But at the same time, it's not going to last forever. So I am doing a daily show and it's one to keep me sane because I get to talk and tell jokes every day. But I know that when this finishes and there's live performances again, be it in September, be it next year, all these people who are watching me every day are very likely to buy tickets. So right now is a time when I'm living on my savings cultivating my uh my audience and life will resume when it's allowed to resume so um yeah just look for it just look for it okay next up we have got um number seven uh being a comedian you thrive off the audience and their reaction have i had a performance where no one laughed <laughs> or engaged in what i had to say no now look very early on, that happened a lot. And this is what I'm saying is I had to deal with failure a lot. There was a time in university when I was escorted off stage. <laughs> I was performing. I was offending people. And one of the other people walked up on stage, grabbed the mic off me and said, who are you to say that? Get off stage. It was terrible. <laughs> but it all has made me a better comedian because when something bad happened, I would go home and I'd think, oh, why did I upset those people? What could I have said differently to not upset those people? And I think that's the thing. Anytime I upset people, I try to figure out if the problem was me or the problem was them. So if, for example, I'm doing a show at a bachelor party and they're all massively drunk and yelling out, you're not funny. I'm like, you're too drunk to even know what's funny. The problem is with you. But in a situation like where I offended a crowd of sane people, clearly the joke which I told was not the right joke for that moment. And so, yeah, so th it happens. It happens. But, you know, you laugh it off. Um, next, have I kept in touch with any of the people who are in my year group in WK? Yes, lots of them. And not only that, because um, I'm always on tour, in every city, I generally meet up with one person who has a WK. Because WK, you know, people scatter and end up in every country and in every city. So I will always have some, some of them who weren't even in my year. I'll have people who left WK years before me messaging me on Facebook saying, I'm coming to your show. Let's talk about WK afterward. So yes, yes, I kept in touch with a lot. And I've kept in touch with a lot with one of them who became a writer. And so we talk about our writing a lot. Next. Um, so, oh, uh, a question from some, last question from the ones I got beforehand. Am I happy? Yes, I am massively happy. I am an extremely happy person because my job is my hobby. My job is my passion. And I almost think that's like big secret to happiness. If you can somehow make what you love your job, oh, it's an amazing privilege because most people don't have that. Most people are just working to survive. And if you get up every day and you're like, I can't wait to work, it's wonderful. Uh, next up, um, have I ever refused a job because my values and the clients misaligned? N not exactly. So what I have done is I have been given a pitch and asked to do a certain thing. And I've said, no, 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 I'll perform for you. I'll be funny, but I won't do that. And then I'll say what I will do. And I've, so I've negotiated. And I'll give you an example. Years, many years ago in Canada, I was booked to do a comedy show. And I guess they were just very happy they had a, an African on. And they kind of wanted me to Africa it up. They were like, okay, so could you come on in a multicolored shirt? We can get you a carved, like one of those 
staves with carvings on it. And, and I was like, that's not me. I'm African, but they're Africans who are like me, right? You know, children of the diaspora who dress like this. I'm not going to pretend to be another kind of African for your show. But what I can do is I can do material about growing up in Africa and expose you to my experience. And other things is like, I, I went for a cartoon, um, a cartoon audition and they asked me to do a, uh, an accent. And the accent they wanted me to do, I felt like they wanted it because it was, actually, it's not, the best example I could give is there was a, a, actually, there is one case where I said no, which was just a year ago. There in the UK, there are things called pantos. A panto is like a play at Christmas. It's very weird. It's like a weird, funny play. And I was offered a role called Simple Sam. And Simple Sam was sort of like a Forrest Gump, dumb, lovable, dumb idiot. But I looked at the role and I looked at the cast and I was like, wait a second. I am the only black character in this play. And you want me to be the dumbest character in this play. I won't do that. If you have at least one other black person, then it's fine. I can be the dumb guy because there's at least a clever black person. But if everyone's white and the only black person is dumb, I refuse. So that was the case where I refused, not because I didn't agree with the role. It was a funny role. It was just the optics of what it was was something I didn't agree with. So that, that was a case. That was a case. Okay. Next up, uh, Ramilla asked me, share with me how I've made funny references to some of my peers, such as Mandla. <laughs> Okay, so one of the dangerous things about befriending or having a relationship with a comedian is eventually I mine everything for comedy. Everything for comedy. So every experience I had back at WK has come up at some point, right? So uh, Ramila's referring to the fact that I did a joke about Manda Mandela being a bully back in the WK times. Because it was funny. It was funny that this person whose grandfather was this paragon of peace and unity was a bully. It didn't make sense, right? So I, I've, I made it funny. Uh, I think he has altered his ways in the time since. So, but I will talk about everything that happened. I've talked about, we used to write letters to Amnesty International. And in one episode of my uh, radio show, um, which was about charity, I talked about how I remember trying to write a, a letter to Mugabe and trying to make it funny because I thought it would tickle him and he would set the person free. And so I'll find the absurd. The absurd is always there. I always think a comedian is like a reporter, but you're only looking for the funny stories. So I look back at my memories and I just take out the funny stories. Next. Um, uh, do you feel that luck has a significance in my success? Muma asks, not really, Muma. I, one, it took so long. <laughs> but I actually am a real belief in this. Someone, I'm not sure who I'm quoting, but someone said luck is the fusion of being prepared and the opportunity. So if you are, I've probably garbled it, but the, I think it's if you are always good every day, eventually the right person will be in the room. And like my break on Britain's Got Talent, I suppose was lucky, but I had auditioned for four or five other things. And one of them would have made my break. And if I hadn't got that one, maybe the next one would. So I don't, I, I think I was lucky in that I was born into a family which, um, you know, allowed me to get a good education. And I think I was lucky in that I have good friends who've been supporting me. So I have those kind of luck. But in terms of the actual career luck, I don't think I've been lucky. Next one. How long does it take me to write a book or play and how many have I written? So I have written one novel. I'm writing another one. I didn't sell the first one. Plays, I've written many. I've probably written around 20 plays and only around four of them have been made. But, you know, the ones which didn't get made, I still consider valuable because it was uh, part of the process of getting better at writing. And jokes I write every day and writing a joke takes me 10 minutes. 
So that's what I do the most often. Okay. Next, um, how do the jokes you use on an African state different from the ones you use in the UK? So some things I talk about everywhere. Some things are universal. I talk about family everywhere. I talk about love everywhere. I talk about religion everywhere. I talk about certain universals, but then I pepper it with local stuff. So here in the UK, I'm talking about Boris Johnson and Brexit and political issues which are valid here. And then when I come to South Africa, I'm talking about, you know, the EFF and I'm talking about, uh, you know, people going on strike and I'm talking about what's going on there. So it's more that before I go to any country, I research what's going on. And then there's also the fact that some things are offensive in one country, which aren't offensive in another. So there is a little bit of tweaking. Like for example, people in Malawi are more sensitive about religion than people in the UK. That doesn't mean I won't do the religious jokes. It just means I will do it in Malawi more carefully. Yes. <laughs> Next up, we go to, have I performed in Eswatini? So Nama Dawson, the I performed in Eswatini only at WK. It was never called stand-up com comedy, but I was always doing funny things on stage. But no, I've not actually performed yet. And at some point, I plan to do the Bushfire Festival. So I will at some point. Uh, Nosipo asks, can you learn to be funny or is it inherent? Yes, you can learn to be funny. That is the answer to that. Now, some people are a bit better at it, but I, I think... Everyone can get to the same spot. It's just they get there quicker and others get there at a different pace. So for example, I do courses where I teach people how to write jokes. Let's say it's a six week course. Some people get to funny in one week. Some take six weeks. Some haven't got there in six weeks, but if they kept at it, they would get there in 12 weeks. So I think anyone can get to funny, but not everyone's a genius. So everyone's funny, but not everyone's Dave Chappelle but everyone can be funny, at least to make people laugh. Okay, next. Um, how did I bring up my pop topic of my career choice to my parents? It was, a, it was a painful and horrible series of ongoing battles in which I told them I wanted to write and they told me, no, I want to do this. And then I told them I want to write and they told, trust me, it was insane. There were family members being called. There were interventions. And it was a very aggressive period. But at the same time, when I look back, even though it was very painful at the time, it was coming from a place of love because they did not want me to be starving on the street. But at the same time, I would have appreciated a little bit more support. But on the flip side, that was my parents. My brothers were all extremely supportive. And I only am a comedian because of my brothers. Because for the first years when I was earning no money doing gigs for 20 pounds, I was staying in my brother's spare room. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, next up, um, may I please share a joke? You would like a joke, says uh, Owen Kosi. What's a joke which would be valid? Okay, I'll think. What I'll do is I'll end the entire talk with a joke. That's what I'll do. Uh, <laughs> next up, um, how do I find the humor in tough situations, says Iarona, and how do I gorge when it might be too soon to make a joke about an issue? I personally think if you are someone intelligent and sensitive, it's never too soon, and you won't go too far because why I... Let me put it this way, I trust myself and I trust my sense of what's appropriate. So I will happily go and talk about things the day they've just happened because I don't think I am mean-spirited enough to talk about it in an insensitive way. But at the same time, there are comedians who get in trouble for saying things insensitively. And for them, I'm like, it's too soon. But I think it depends what you're saying. So it's a very hard, nebulous thing to explain. But I'm, I just think that the world generally sort of agrees with my take on things. So I don't need to worry about offending everybody. Yeah. Next up. Okay, I think, I think that's it. 
I'll see if there are any final questions, then I will do a joke and that will be that. So let's, anyone else who's got a question, type now or forever hold your peace. Hello, little person next to Nosipo. I see that they're, they're, they're very, very little people watching. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, here we go. Nope, that's it. So we just do it. Okay, so I'm going to do a joke from, um, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the difficult situation which created this joke, and then I'm going to tell you the joke. And you will see that reality and the joke have very little in common because, so when I was at WK, I was a Christian. And then while I was at WK, I was invited by another student to go to a Baha'i meeting. And then I started going to Baha'i meetings. And then I decided that I wanted to switch religion and become a Baha'i. Now, when I told my family who were very religious, they were horrified. They were like, oh my gosh. And they called the local reverend to come and talk me out of it. And it was a crazy situation with this reverend and my father yelling at me and telling me that I was going to go to hell and me arguing back at them. And then it was this really bizarre situation, which was painful at that, but there was something funny in it. And I could never find a way to make it funny until I created a sort of metaphor and turned it into this story. So this didn't happen, but you can see where it came from. Okay. So Malawi is very religious, right? Malawi is very religious. None of you understand how religious, so religious. In fact, that when I was 14, I started acting up. Your parents might have called a psychiatrist. My dad called an exorcist. I don't know if any of you have ever been exercised. I don't recommend it. They strap you to the bed with ropes. They start pouring holy water in your mouth. I was coughing and sputtering. <laughs> My dad, it's so weird to do the joke to no audience because there should be a laugh over there. <laughs> but let me keep going. <laughs> I was coughing and sputtering. My dad didn't think this was enough. There was a big wooden cross on the wall. He grabbed it, passed it to the priest and said, beat him, beat the devil out of him. The priest started to whack me. I was on the bed going, ah, ah, ah. So understandably, when the priest said, Satan, I figured I better play along. Now I've watched the Exorcist movie. I cannot turn my head around 360 degrees, but I gave it a shot. I was like, Bleh. I put on my best devil voice and I was like, yes, I am Lucifer. He said, Satan, leave this boy. I said, I'm leaving. Then I got a great idea. I pointed at my dad and I said, I'm going into him. So there you go. That there is one of my favorite jokes. And you see how I start with the truth and then I just let my... Uh, aim imagination go wild. But I think that even in a zany story, having a little bit of emotional honesty helps keep it together. Excellent. So that is the whole of my chat. Uh, do we have any other, any other things before we, we head out? Thank you everyone for coming. This has been very insightful. And I think you were right at the beginning in saying that it's not just about um, art and being engaged in that area, but it's just about the things that we try to do. And I hope that, I know for myself, I got a couple of lessons from this and I hope that our students and our community also got um, lessons, not just about um, the art industry, but just about pursuing what we want and having those hard conversations with our parents. So um, I think we will call it um, a night. Thank you so much for um, Wonderful. Being part of this. It was a pleasure and indeed. We look forward to that bushfire performance in the near future. And of course. With that, I hope that everyone has a lovely evening and yeah. Marvelous. Good night.